To you, the listener, I'm not writing this for the usual reasons. This isn't some cry for help, nor is it another report of mysterious happenings that led to the deaths of those involved. I'm writing this to tell you about something that's been affecting me for well over the last decade, something that I've only recently come to become suspicious of. You see, I'm one of those infuriating people that are, well, quite to their own enjoyment, are naturally adept at the processes of lucid dreaming. You know, the thing where you're able to dream but you're still awake? Yeah, I'm pretty much doing that every single night. I've always been able to just, like, at a flick of the switch, suddenly wherever I want, wherever I want to be, is happening, and I'm experiencing it just as I would in real life. Even when I was little, I used to sleep soundly into my own little fantasy world full of whatever caught my eye the previous day. I would be, I don't know, a superhero flying, you know, helping people, destroying villains, or I would be a knight chasing into a castle to help the helpless maiden. You name it, I lived it, and the entire time, I was sleeping. So why on earth would I have any complaints about being able to will into existence anything and everything I desire you mutter to yourself at 3 in the morning on whatever night you decide to listen to this? Well. It all started with a thump. I was 10 years old, and a energetic little shit at that too. My father and I used to live in the middle of a forest so thick, it strangled the house. It was a nuisance to my father, who regularly cut the back trail and of bramble and heavy sheets of wood and thorn that drove up to the house. But for a manically excitable little lad like myself, it was almost paradise as my sleeping mind was. On another note, it was safe to say from ages 4 and upwards, I was essentially feral. I would run through the undergrowth with such speed and skill born from thousands of trips through the cutting thorns, I, which in hindsight I barely even registered at that point, sporting a homemade bow and arrow hunting imaginary bears and wolves. You know, basic kid pretend time affairs. It was even better, however, with more people. My friends and I would play team tag through the woods, and it would usually end with me and my closest friends Jack and Thomas winning by default. Either because someone had fallen and was crying, or we were up in a tree and couldn't be found, let along reach for a whole game of tag. It was on one of those excursions that it happened. See, there was a clearing about 300 meters into the forest, and in it was the remains of an old house, a great stone behemoth of a dwelling, which sat there alone and ran down amidst the dark forestry. I'd been there hundreds of times before, and the husk was now one of my most favorite places in the world. It had been gutted, of course, and so that all that remained there was old floorboards. These were now, much to the wonder of my group when we found it, held up by massive black bark trees, whose, well, branches were safe to walk on. And thus, this became our designated fort. We would furnish the place with all manner of stuff, chairs made from tree stumps, <laughs> which we would ding up with larger rocks, and other bits and bobbles like uh, posters and etc etc etc. The tree itself was used in place of stairs since, well, the actual stairs had collapsed since. I would dream of the place, of how it looked when it was big, in its prime, or even when it had a roof. I would see the stately family sitting around a roaring fireplace while snow gently brushed against the brash latch windows. I loved that place. Though what I loved most was the tree in the middle. It was almost pitch black and of no discernible species that my five-year-old mind could comprehend. It was huge, though I stretched higher than any other tree around it, and if you were careful, and my father was nowhere to be seen, then you could climb up atop most of the branches and look over to the rolling courtside of the undilating hills in the distance. Where I spent the majority of my time, however, was in the topmost rooms of the house itself, where the tree had grown incredibly curiously. Where the tree had grown in the very middle of the house, its great branches was holding the other floors through sheer consequence of where they had grown. Thick and strong enough to act as a support, but where the tree reached was the almost the attic room. And it did something strange. 
it cradled it in almost a perfect basket. Its branches and great bows and struggling trunks coiled around the freaking room and walls, holding it up almost exactly where it had been. Obviously, where it had been before, it had fallen in disrepair, but it still looked like the room itself hadn't suffered too much damage. I would sit on the windowsill of that room looking out, watching over the other children run around. And you know what? I felt like a king lording over his subjects. The window was still in place, so I could open it up and shout orders to the other kids, who would run around and to from our piles of unwanting building material that we poached from a nearby housing development, going about building whatever they thought the place needed. It was in that room that I sat on that day, looking over to the children below. Myself finished a chair that I hastily nailed together and now was gently resting on before going down to take another batch of wood up to the room, intending to make a table. I got up and I was about to start towards the doorway when I heard Thomas calling me from down in the forest below. Hey John, come to the window, I've got to ask you something. His voice sounded excited, so I turned like any rational person and slid over to the great port window, opening it. I have this thing at my house that lets you put holes in things. Like a hand drill thingy. I'm gonna get it in a few... And at that moment his sense was just cut off as for some reason at that moment I was flying out the window, plumbing towards the ground, and then I hit it with a sickening thump and crash. And then... I was in the house, and it was dark, and I was laying in a great four-posture bed in the middle of the room. But not, not just any room, it was my room. <laughs> the one on the top floor of the house, as far as I could tell, the house wasn't in the same state of disrepair as I was used to, but nor was there any indication that anyone was living in it. The bed was cold, and the sheet smelt musty under and over me. I was lying still, my eyes scanning what little sliver of room I could see in the dark. I mustered the courage to sit up, my eyes were fixing on the dark room around me. There was a wardrobe in the far end of the room, and dust drifted across a gash of moonlight which slipped through the mangled and moth-eaten curtains. I stared, not quite understanding what was going on to the slightest. Now, I remembered being called by Thomas and walking to the window. but. Then it was all hazy, like there was something I was missing out on, a memory that played and danced across the space between conscious and unconscious thought. The air was whistling through, and the gap in the curtains was giving a menacing feeling, like there was something wrong with the place. I, I stared into the darkness, just trying to make out more of the place. And then... The darkness stared back. A pair of black-rimmed purple slashes opened up into, into the shadows of the room. They were long, sharp, and tapered po with points at each side. They were angled slightly inwards, giving them the impression that whatever their belong was angry and scowling. And they were staring right at me. The eyes were emitting a faint glow, which gave them an even more menacing look. I stared back, frozen on the spot, not even breathing, as the eyes began to move in from the darkness. A form was becoming visible, broad and lean, made of what looked like a wraithing darkness, a wraith in purple flames. As it approached, the flames died down, leaving only a black outline of the fucking thing, faintly rimmed in purple light. The He saw its... He saw its hands pointed at the ends and flickering back and forth of a weird nature of whatever the thing was actually made out of. Long tendrils of shadow hung from its back and the back of its head, wreathing like snakes in the air like they were caught in some sort of breeze behind the creature. As it fully emerged into my line of sight, it stopped, standing tall and humanoid, and it projected a air of absolute malice from its faintly flickering, burning body. And then... It smiled. It fucking smiled! Lo a long gash opened into the shape of a smile from one side of its face to the other, the jagged edges forming teeth-like points. The same purple glow issued from within its throat, throwing each point into a stark relief. Its smile, coupled with its malevolent gaze, terrified me so much that I finally let out a scream that shook me, shook me to my very core. 
it seemed to be unfazed, just lifting a single pointed finger, pointing it at its lipless mouth, emitting a low, quiet shh. At that moment, I shushed. Its tall frame began to move again as it walked the length of the room, stopping about a foot from the bed and from me, and sitting gently down at the end of the mattress. Then it spoke with a voice like Black Satan, and it said, No. Not now, my dear boy. I've waited ages for you. It reached forward and placed a hand on my forehead. Its touch was colder than any snow or ice, like the very night had come across my face. And again, it smiled with more malice than I've ever seen in any human. Just as it removed his hand, I blinked. I was lying in a darkened hospital ward, a bandage wrapped tightly around my head. I could only see a faint light coming from the nervous office, two wards down. But it was enough to make out the form of my father sitting on a chair beside my bed. He jolted awake when I called him, jumping to his feet, shouting for a nurse. It turns out that I fell about two fairly high stories of what should have been to my death, but what only could be described of a miracle of a reason. I had survived with only a minor skull fracture, nothing a few weeks on the couch playing Ratchet and Clank couldn't fix. But I could never quite shake that feeling of quiet, cold dread I got when I scanned the darkened corners of my room in the dead of night, waiting for the faint purple glow to indicate the presence of that thing. But as of late, it's not the darkness I fear. See, lately I've been seeing things, indications in my usual nightly concave of debauchery without consequence as I thoroughly abused my lucid dreams. I felt the eyes on the back of my head, the eyes that I cannot will away. I've seen flashes of it in dark alleyways of as cabs through the darkened streets of my own personal city bringing me to whatever party I have in my I have that night. I've seen it in the darkness. I've heard it whisper. I'm not fucking crazy. Honestly, I'm, I'm not fucking crazy. I swear to this day, I heard it say. My dear boy. So that's it. That That's my story. I'm starting to get really weirded out by this thing as if it wasn't enough that the damn thing is terrifying. It, it, it's odd. I control everything else in those dreams, so... Why can't I make this go away? But it is the only thing in the entire dream world that doesn't bend my influence. I'll have more for you later when the bed isn't looking so appealing as of right now. To yours, my listener, Johnny Black. <laughs>